Let's take a look at problem 6-8A, which is your homework problem for chapter 6. This problem deals with the different cost flow assumptions that we make with inventory. We're going to work with the perpetual inventory system, and later on I'm going to do the exact same problem using the periodic inventory system. In this problem, we've been told that a retailer uh, operates in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, they use a perpetual inventory system. They have no credit transactions. All amounts are settled in cash, which means all your purchase and your sales transaction are in cash. And they provided you with the following information for the month of January. You ended December 31st, which means you began January 1st with 160 units that you had paid $20. In this last column, you have unit cost or selling price. We'll see what that, how we deal with that. The next day, you purchased another 100 units and you paid $22 for it. On the 6th, you sold 180 units. The selling price is $40 a unit, not the cost, the selling price. The exercise we are going to go, be, going to go through is to find out what the cost of these 40 units are. On the 9th, we purchased another 75 units. We paid $24 per unit. On the 10th, we made another sale. We sold 50 units, for which we charged. We sold it at $45 per unit. Again, we don't know the cost per unit. On the 23rd, you purchased 100 units, and you paid $25 a unit. On the 30th, you made a sale of 130 units, and you sold it at $48 per piece. So they've asked us to calculate the cost of goods sold, ending inventory, and gross profit using the LIFO, FIFO, and moving average method. I'm going to do it in the reverse order, moving average, FIFO, and LIFO. They've also asked us for the moving average to keep everything to three decimal places. And we'll see how to deal with that. They've given us your, the answer of gross profit for each of the three methods. After I go through the whole problem, we'll make sure that our answers are in fact what they told us it should be. As you can see over here in Excel, what I have done is I've set up a table in, uh, for each of the three methods. So let's start with the moving average method. As with a journal entry or anything else we do in accounting, I need to have a column for date. The next thing I'm concerned with is the transactions that increase or decrease my inventory balance. Purchase transactions are going to increase my inventory balance. Sales transactions are going to decrease my inventory balance. And what I'm concerned with is calculating this cost of goods sold expense number. And then to find out how much inventory I have on hand, which means after a purchase or sale has taken place, what's the balance I have. In the moving average method, Every time we make a purchase, we calculate the average cost of our inventory. When we make a sale, we don't have to calculate the average cost. When we make a purchase, we have to calculate it. So let's start with Jan first. I have 180 units for which I had paid $20 a piece. I can just bring that number over here and input that information saying I have 160 units on hand. $20 a piece. The extension simply means 160 times 20. I have 3,200. On the second, I purchased 100 units for which I paid $22 a piece. So it's 100 units times 22 gives me 2,200. This is a purchase that I made. Now, obviously, each of these transactions are going to result in a journal entry not for just transferring the balance from last year to this year, but when we have a real transaction, which is what we're looking at over here. So on Jan 2nd, my journal entry would have been inventory debit, cash credit. I know the amount how much I paid, 2,200. Okay, now, how many units do I have on hand? I have the 160 from the prior period, I have 100 that I added today. So I have a total of 120, I'm sorry, 200, 260 units. I had paid 
20 and 22 dollars per unit respectively for each of these purchases i already knew how much i had paid in terms of the extension you add these numbers and you get 5400 in the moving average method the last step i need to do over here is calculate the average price of the 260 units which is simply $5,400 divided by 260, and that gives me $20.7, and uh, 20.769. And the reason I'm keeping this to three decimal places in the problem they've told you, round cost per unit to three decimal places. That's the reason I'm doing this. I'm keeping the three decimal places. Now, this number is important. I put this in bold over here, and we'll see when we're going to use this number. On the 6th, we made a sale. I sold 180 units. Okay. This is the selling price. I'm not going to use it in this table. I need to know what was the cost of the 180 units I sold. In the moving average method, I take this number and bring that over here. I calculate the extension and it tells me how much I, the cost of the goods sold is. How much am I left with? 260 minus 180, that's 80. The cost per unit, I just take it from the previous step and I calculate the extension. Or an easier way to do that would have been 5400 minus this number is what's left over. Now let's look at the journal entry. On Jan 6th, we sold 180 units for $40 a piece. My journal entry would be cash debit, sales credit. This journal entry is always at selling price. In this case, it was $40 a piece. So I get 180 times 40 gives me 7,200. I have to do a second journal entry because I'm using the perpetual inventory system. Cost of goods sold debit, inventory credit, and I get that number from here. So let me highlight this to indicate where I got this information from. Okay, so I'm gonna jump the gun a little over here and go to the FIFO method and show you what stays the same and what's going to be different. In the FIFO method, actually I'll show you only what stays the same. The beginning inventory balance, what I had from last year, will stay exactly the same. The purchase I made will stay the same. No difference. I bring the information over here. But what's different is I'm not going to calculate a per unit. And we'll see how to take care of that a little later. Okay? And I'll show you the sales transactions, how we calculate cost of goods sold a little later when I come back into the FIFO method. Just wanted to show you that this purchase, whatever I have in the moving average method, will be same in the FIFO, will be same in LIFO, doesn't make any difference. Let's come back to the moving average method. On the 9th, I made another purchase of 75 units for which I paid $24 a piece. Now, how many units do I have? I have this 80. I bring that from the previous uh, line. I have the current day's purchase. I have a total of 155 units on hand. The total cost is 3461.538. I need to calculate an average cost. Recall, every time I make a purchase, I recalculate the average cost. I don't recalculate the average cost when I make a sale. So I recalculate the average cost, and the average cost is 22.333. The reason this number went up from the previous step is because the cost of this inventory is going up. I had paid, from last year it was $20 a piece, then it became 22, now I paid 24, so even the average cost obviously is gonna go up. 
On the 10th, I sold 50 units for $45 a piece. I sold 50. What's the cost of the units that I sold? This number. The cost of the units that I sold is 22.333 and that I got it from here. The extension is again, just multiply 50 times 22.333. What am I left with? 155 minus 50 gives me 105. What's the average cost? I just bring this number down over here. And again, either I can do the multiplication or I can do this previous number, dollar amount minus the cost of goods sold and it'll give me the inventory on hand. On the 23rd, I made another purchase. I made a purchase of 100 units for which I paid $25 per unit. What do I have on hand now? I have the 105. I just bring this total. I don't have to bring the 80, 75. I just bring 105 and the moving average. I now have 205 units on hand for which I paid. The total cost is $4,844.913. Average cost is this dollar amount divided by units on hand, leaving me with $23.634 as the average cost. Finally, on the 30th, I sold 130 units. And what's the cost of the units sold? You bring this number over here. What am I left with? 205 minus 130 gives me 75. Just bring this number down here, the av moving average number. And the extension again, either you can do the multiplication or you can do 4844.913 minus the number over here and you'll get this answer. So again, to recap, in the moving average method, we recalculate the moving average every time there is a purchase transaction. We don't have to do that when there's a sale. Only when there's a purchase, we recalculate what's the average cost of the inventory that we have on hand. The journal entry and all the information for the purchase transaction is going to stay the same, regardless of which cost flow method we use. When we sell inventory, the first journal entry stays the same in all the methods. It's a second journal entry, cost of goods sold, debit, inventory, credit. That's a book entry. In our books, we're identifying how much of that inventory was sold and what was the cost of the inventory sold. While the quantity of inventory is going to stay the same in all the methods, the cost we assign is going to be different depending on which method we use. Now, in the problem, they've asked you to calculate the gross profit, the cost of goods sold, ending inventory, and gross profit. So now cost of goods sold, I'm going to do the total over here. For the month is this number plus this number plus this number. So basically what I've looked at is I've added up I've added up the cost of goods sold that I had for each time I made a sale. That's your total cost of goods sold. Ending inventory, this is the number we have on hand at the end, 75 units and this is the number. The sales, in order to get gross profit, I need to know sales. So here's what I'm gonna do for sales. I'm just going to identify the dates I made the sale how many units I sold on each of those dates? It was 180, 50, and 130. What was the selling price per unit? 40, 45, 48. And what was the dollar amount of the sale? And I come up with this number over here. Okay, and we're gonna see where we're gonna use that a little later on. Okay, now let's compare this method with the FIFO method. 
I already showed you what stays the same. The inventory I have on hand from last year stays the same. I made a purchase. It is what it is. It's what I paid the vendor. So I have a total of 260 units. The cost is 5400. That stays the same. Now let's take this to the next transaction, which is the sixth. I sold 180 units. So now the focus is on these units I have over here. I have 160 and 100 units, a total of 260 units. I sold 180. First in, first out. What came into the business first should leave the business first. So the 180 units that I'm going to sell, I first sell the 160. So all of this is going to be sold. And how much more do I need from the second lot? I need 20, the balance. That's at $22 a piece. Finishing up my information over here. My cost of goods sold is 3,640. What do I have left with me? This 160 is all gone. Of this 100, 20 is gone. So what's remaining with me is 80. 80 units that I had paid $22 a piece, that's what's remaining. Again, you can confirm 5,400 minus 3640 gives me 1760. So the inventory I had on hand, some of it became cost of goods sold and the remaining is staying with me. On the 9th, I purchased 75 units for $24 a piece. What do I have on hand now? I have this 80 and I have the 75. I paid 22 and here I paid 24. So you bring all that information over here. On the 10th, I sold 50 units. First in, first out. I'm going to take the 50 from here. That's what's sold. What remains with me? Is any of this remaining? Yes. 80 minus 50 is 30. The 75 is anything remaining? All of it. On the 23rd, I made another purchase. My purchase is 100 units at $25 a piece. What do I have on hand now? I have 30, 75, and 100, for which I paid 22, 24, and 25. Okay. And finally, I sold 130 units on Jan 30th. On January 30th, I sold 130 units. So what will I sell? First in, first out. This 30, this 75, and then I dip into this number over here, what I have. So my sales are 30, 75, and 25. They give me the 130. What remains with me? Is any of this remaining? No, that's all gone. Any of this remaining? That's all gone. Is any of this remaining? Yeah, I sold only 25 of that. So what's remaining over here is 75 units for which I had paid $25 a piece. So as you can see, at the end, I'm left with 75 units, the same that I was left with when I did the moving average method. That's not gonna change. But the amount that I have assigned to ending inventory is gonna be different. Okay, let's go to the other exercise here of <coughs> adding up my cost of goods sold. It's going to be this number plus this number plus this number. When I add up those three, I get my cost of goods sold. My ending inventory is this number. What about sales? It's going to be the exact same amount. It's not going to change. I sold 360 units. I sold it for 15,690, that doesn't change. Let's take a look at a couple journal entries. We've done these two journal entries. Let's see how it's gonna be different over here. Which one is gonna be identical? Or oh, the first one, the purchase transaction, no change. When I sold the in inventory on Jan 6th, the first journal entry, 
will be exactly the same as I had before. Remember I said that's not going to be different? What's going to be different is the amount I assign to that second journal entry. The accounts debited and credited are the same, but the amount assigned will be different. On Jan 6 in the moving average method, I had assigned 3738.462. Now the number is going to be 3640. So I've done only two journal entries. The pattern follows the exact same thing. <coughs> now let's take a, take a look at the last and first out method. Should already be getting a hang of this as to what we're going to do. We have the same format of the table set up. The first line is going to stay the same. The inventory that I had before has been brought over, no change. All my purchase transactions are going to be exactly the same. So I'm just going to copy that number over here, those, that information for the three purchase transactions. Units I have on hand, that part stays the same. Now the difference comes is when I make a sale. On Jan 6th, I sold 180 units. I had 160 and I had 100 available. I'm now looking at last in first out. 100 units came to me last. That's the most recent purchase. That's going to go out first. How many did I sell? I sold 180. So for the other 80, I dip into that first set of inventory I have. So I'm in the last and first out, the most recent purchase is going to sell first. What remains with me after this sale? I had 160 and 100. Is any of the 100 remaining? No, that's all gone. So what's remaining is 60 from that previous batch. That is what I brought forward from the previous year. So who knows how old that inventory is? That's still sitting with me. I purchased 75 units on Jan 9. How much do I have with me on hand? I have 80 and 75. On Jan 10th, I sold 50 units. Which of these two am I going to sell? 80 or 75? Obviously 75. Okay. What remains with me? The 80 or the 75? From the 75, I have 25 remaining. From the 80, well, all of it is still remaining with me. Then I made a purchase of 100 units on the 23rd. What do I have on hand? I have 80, 25, and 100. So I have 80, 25, and 100 remaining with me. On the 30th, I sold 130 units. Okay, so I've sold 130 units. Which did I sell? I first sell from here, all 100. Then I take 25 from here, all of it. And then I'll have to go in over here and take five. What's remaining with me after this? Is any of this remaining? Nope, gone. This, all gone. Of this 80, five is gone, 75 is remaining with me. So the inventory that stays with me over here is the oldest inventory in the last in first out method because whatever comes in last is what I'm selling first. So actually this inventory at December 30, what I had at December 31st is still sitting with me over here at the end of January. Let's go through this process of calculating our cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold expense for the month. Okay. <clears throat> and let's look at this journal entries, the journal entries before we proceed. The journal entries for the purchase transaction, we already know that stays exactly the same as the other two methods. When we make a sale, there are two journal entries. The first one stays the same as we did in the previous two cases. 
It's only this cost of goods sold debit inventory credit that's going to be different. And what are we going to have over here? These numbers are coming from this column which we calculated over here for each of those journal entries. Okay. Now that we've gone through this process, let's do the final part and see what our gross profit is going to be. The sales is going to be the same for all methods. Cost of goods sold expense is what's different for each of the methods, which then means our gross profit is going to be different from each of these methods. So let's compare the answers to what was given. The gross profit under the last in first out is 7,490. The last in first out, 7,490. The first in first out, 7,865. And that's what we have over here, 7,865. The moving average method is 7,762. They rounded up this number, 7,762.53, which is 63 is what we have. So where do we find the difference? The difference is really what we assign. It's based on how we assign the numbers that we're going to come up with different gross profit numbers. Okay, so in this example, again, if you recap, in the moving average method, we have to calculate a moving average every time there's a purchase, and you just use that number whenever you have a sale, and then to record how much you have in your inventory on hand. In the first in first out method, we have to keep detailed documentation, both for first in first out and last in first out, of purchases made, the layers of purchase. And every time we have a sale, if it's first in first out, the oldest purchase is moved out first. If it's last in first out, the most recent purchase is moved out first. This seems rather tedious in terms of how we have done this work. However, remember for companies, all of this is computerized. All they need to do is put down how many units have been purchased, the cost of purchase. All these can be set up as formulas that will be calculated automatically, regardless of which method we're looking at. Also the sales, all you'd have to do is identify how many units are sold in a transaction and depending on which method you have pre-chosen, the computer will calculate what the cost of goods sold is and the inventory on hand is. You will not be, have to worry about the busy work if you are running a business, but you do need to know what is happening behind the scenes especially this inventory on hand. The old inventory that you're keeping, you want to keep a track of it. Taking a, uh, a step further, accounting is always used in business. We use this to make decisions. As an example, in this last and first out, I have 75 units on hand remaining with me, and the cost is $20 per unit that's sitting with me, the selling price, as you saw, has gone up to $48 per unit. If I want to move this merchandise out quickly, because if there's a risk that I won't be able to sell it, I could probably just lower the price a little. From 48, I can drop it to 47, or even take it back to 45, and I may be able to clear this inventory altogether. I could sell all of it real fast, because from the customer's point of view, they're thinking, they're getting this at a discounted price. For you, it's still $20 versus $45. You still have a $25 profit on this. Remember, there's a cost attached to carrying inventory. That means keeping inventory. You have to store the inventory. You have to carry insurance on it. You have to take care of all of this inventory and you run the risk. It may not sell at all in the future. If it's a last, first in, first out method, and you're seeing how your inventory is moving, again, there are various decisions you can make as to, can I increase the price? What's the tolerance? How much did I buy it for? If my price has gone up from 22 to 24 to 25, should I be moving my price from 40 to 45 to 48, or should I be going at a faster rate? There are various decisions that are made, that are made based on the details that you see over here, the richness of the information you have in this method. So in a few minutes, we will look at the periodic inventory system.